In today's episode, we put a fairly unlikely voxel claim to the test, and then, for our grand finale, go in search for the future of the Scottish automotive industry. Enjoy. Okay, so it's our last day. We're en route to our final activity of the whole trip. But first we're gonna try a little task. Vauxhall, in their press release when they launched this car, said that the roof could be put up in 40 seconds. I don't reckon it's at all. Let's give this a go. Okay, subject, you're in your car. You're having a great day out. Yep. Sun's out, roof's off. Yep. Alas, what is this overhead approaching in 40 seconds? It's rain. Okay, so you gotta put up your roof in 40 seconds in three. Oh, wait, 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 okay. Okay, so I've gotta pop the boot, get out of the car, get the bag out of the boot, take the roof out of the bag, and then put the roof onto the car in 40 seconds. It can be done. A apparent, okay. Quickly, sorry about the blank phone screen. I forgot I had my polarizing filter fitted to my camera lens. And a camera, plus a polarizing filter, plus a reflective phone screen, equals, well, a blank unreadable phone screen. So instead you've got this post-production stopwatch. Anyway. Three, two, one, go. Okay. Out the car very smoothly. Pop the boot. Okay. Five seconds. Fortunately, the boot is right there. Okay. Now, the boot can take consists of three things, two ah, bars, yellow arrows facing frontwards, so I've got long arms I can do. Would you like to know the timing? Yes. 27 seconds. Little front arrows, so that needs to go on. I've got to be so impressed. There, like that, pull that over that way. Okay. Now time. That's not bad. Yeah, that's it's not bad. bad, but you're getting wet, I'm afraid. That roof, <gasps> that's pretty damn good. I was. How far out do you think? I reckon you were 10 seconds out? No, five seconds. Five no, seconds. I don't know when. All right, shall we move it a bit then? This time, you are. Out the car. Out the car. So this time. Just had a nice picnic, you've just put your picnic stuff back in the car and the boot's open and alas, the rain is on its way, it's landing in 40 seconds and in three, two, one, go. Okay. Yellow arrow forwards. Ah. Bit of a fast there. Okay. 20 seconds. Got arrows, and then face forward. Tell me when it's 10 seconds. 10 seconds. I got this. Done! Done! Get the boot closed. I'm gone! <laughs> 40 seconds. And I'm in. Okay, that okay. is. That's good, that's good. We'll totally count Woo! that. I totally expected it to be one of those things where we had a go at this and it was going to take a minute, a minute and a half or something. Yeah. So, thumbs up to Vauxhall. So far on our trip, we had drag raced against some fierce foes, hunted out a vintage supercar, learned how Scotland's changed the car industry forever with the pneumatic tyre, and driven some of the best roads in all of the UK. And whilst our trip had shown us that Scotland is full to the brim with automotive history and excitement, it had also made us realise something else. Something concerning. We hadn't once talked about the Scottish car industry of today. But that's because it barely exists. Fortunately though, in an old military canteen based just south of Edinburgh, 
A small group of people are dedicated to changing that fact, and we were off to pay them a visit in order to see what the only current car manufacturer in Scotland has to offer the world. So, it's along here somewhere, and what they said is look out for the Concorde. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Well, never mind the Concorde, we don't need to see that. I think it's pretty clear what we're here for. Well, from that shot, I guess it's not very apparent what we're here for, but this should clear things up. This is what we're here for. Raptor, and that's it in there. Before we go into the cars, let me tell you about the company because the story is about as special as the four wheels. So, here's the story of Raptor Sports Cars in four minutes. The story of Raptor Sports Cars begins with the story of two people, Kirsten and Andy, husband and wife, and the founders of Raptor. It all kicks off in the early 2000s. Andy was working as a hydro engineer, he and Kirsten were expecting their first child, and life was good. There was just one thing, Andy had always loved the idea of a Lotus 7 style car, but at a lofty 6 foot 7, no manufacturer yet produced a car that would comfortably fit him. He and Kirsten talked about the idea of building such a car and then selling them, but with a baby on the way, it was far from the ideal time to take on such an endeavour so they decided against it. Sometimes though, fate can give you a brutal shove, and not long before the baby was due to arrive, Andy lost his job as a hydro engineer. Whether ideal or not, the time had arrived. The time to risk it all and take the plunge. But starting a car company and building an entire car is expensive, and going too big too soon can cause catastrophes, as we well know. So Andy first focused on the heart of all cars, the engine. The plan was to build engines and build a reputation for excellent engineering, and it worked. His engine started winning championships such as the British Rallycross Championship. At this point, people buying the engines would often ask Andy a question. Have you ever thought about making your own car to fit the engines to? This was the moment he'd been waiting for. For over a decade, he'd been building engines, saving money and gathering attention. And now, he had a market to build a car for. So he began. Andy set himself a brief. The car had to be a classic Lotus 7 shape, yet must comfortably fit his tall frame. And it must forego any components that could compromise the handling of the car. Strength and lightness were to be prioritised over ease of manufacturing and profit margins, as the car had to feel like a race car that was somehow road legal, as opposed to a road car that could occasionally be taken onto the track. This was to be achieved by using components that were primarily designed for motorsport, and taking them onto the road. In 2013, Raptor unveiled and sold their first model. It had a Suzuki Hayabusa engine that revved to 11,000 RPM, encased in a lightweight chassis that made the car utterly bonkers to drive. It was suitably named the Raptor. Why Raptor? Well, the name is inspired by the F-22 Raptor, as Andy and Kirsten believe their cars share certain characteristics with the fighter jet. From the outside, the F-22 Raptor looks near enough like any other fighter jet, However, once you peel back the skin, it reveals itself to be the pinnacle of aviation technology. This is how Raptors see their cars, because, to quote Andy and Kirsten, they may look like any other 7 type car, however, it is technically far superior to anything else out there. Naming your first car after your company name is a classic debut album move that puts them in the same group as Madonna, Elvis and Gorillaz. However, unlike some of their peers, Raptor's sophomore project, the RR, with a powerhouse engine and a redesigned and upgraded chassis, was exclusively an improvement on their first release. But the whiteboard isn't the place to show you what makes it so special. So without any further ado... Right, let's look at the cars. Okay, this is the Raptor RR. Yeah, so this is the second generation 
car. First one being the Raptor R, which is over there. And this is the RR, which uh, primarily is different because it's got a different engine power plant and it's got a different chassis. Yes. You know what, first thing, should we take a look at that engine? Yes. Full clip. Here it is. Kind of the star of the show. Ford Fiesta EcoBoost engine, putting out about 235 brake horsepower. Yeah, which is more than the standard Fiesta ST would make. I think primarily it's done because it's been uh, remapped and there's the custom Raptor ECU. Fuel filler cap's there, so presumably the fuel tank is somewhere below. What haven't you got under here? You haven't really got a boot or any storage. You have not. So as a result, it's not the most practical car, but I guess if you were touring in the car, you'd have some pannier bags or rucksacks and you could easily strap them to this. So you would survive. Uh, one of the typical issues with this style car is you've got the big old exhaust here, which is fine right now, but when you've gone for a spirited drive, this gets very, very hot. I've seen lots of people with burnt legs over the years because they forget about it. The immediate thing you notice when getting in, I'm six foot two and I'm comfortable. And I believe Andy, the creator of the cars, is six foot five, six foot six. And this is designed for him, so it's comfortable. So digital display, which is pretty cool. Richard then suggested that I try sitting in the car and it highlighted a somewhat issue with the RR. I was far too small. In a car set up for drivers six foot two and above, I could hardly reach the pedals and steering wheel. And unfortunately, the driver's side seat isn't on adjustable rails. If you're the sole driver of the car, this is no problem. Raptor will customise the seat to suit your body type and then bolt it into the perfect position for your leg length. You'll probably have the best driving position you've ever experienced. However, it does mean that if you're inclined to let other people have a go in your car, or for example, you're on a road trip and want to share the driving, unless they're the identical height, the second driver is going to find themselves either stretching for the pedals and wheel or crammed in due to the lack of readily available adjustability. It's just a compromise you have to make for the uncompromising experience of the Raptor RR. Another pretty special thing about this car is the suspension. It's got pushrod suspension, kind of like a Formula One car. Pushrod suspension moves the suspension components to sit in the centre of the car, beneath the bodywork, rather than being out next to the wheels. Amongst other things, it allows for greater flexibility in setting up the car, reduced drag, and it makes for a cleaner aesthetic too, which is always nice. It's not a half measures feature at all, and along with components such as the substantial four pot wheelwood brakes, it demonstrates that Raptor are in the game to beat the big hitters of the open wheel sports car market. In fact, the car is finished to such a nice standard with an optional faux leather interior that there's only a couple of parts that give away the facts that this car isn't made on a big budget. Namely, the wing mirrors, which are taken from a motorbike, and the rear view mirror, which is an off the shelf kit car item. There's one more component which, initially, may seem like a product of budget restraints, but it is in fact just the result of a really clever and well thought out decision. Rather than having carbon fibre wheel arches, they opted to put plastic ones on. Initially, a couple of years ago, I would have thought this is actually a bit of a cop out, but having driven the VX220, and I remember when you first got that car and I asked you whether you were going to put a carbon rear splitter on it. There's no way any part of the car that is at risk of stone chips or things like that, don't put carbon on it. It's just going to get wrecked. By putting plastic on this and carbon wrapping it, you're not losing much in terms of weight. You've got a nice aesthetic still. And on top of all of that, if a stone does hit it or it gets clipped, it's pence to the dollar to replace as opposed to carbon fibre. Yeah, let's go have a look at the chassis. That's no problem at all. This chassis weighs about 90 kilograms, just about 110 with this roll cage on there. And it's stiff. They use super stiff steel for torsional rigidity. They're built right here up in Scotland. And the chassis weighing just that small amount means the car weighs very little, gives the entire car a power to weight ratio of 440 brake horsepower per tonne, which is damn good. 
damn good means better than a Ferrari F40, a Lamborghini Aventador and a McLaren 12C. I quickly want to mention this. This is kind of where it all started. This is the Raptor R. And what's really cool about this, look where the seat is. It's far forward. This car, oh, that's far more to my liking. But it does feel so good to be in there. It kind of makes you think, what's it like to get them actually moving? I want to take this thing out for a drive. By definition, it means an emotive feeling, not one led by or affected by intellect. For example, the visceral feeling of fear when you step on the accelerator of the Raptor RR and find yourself propelled from 0 to 60 miles per hour in 3.8 seconds. Or how about the visceral feeling of wonder when you learn that the car you've spent the last week driving around Scotland feels comparatively Cadillac beside the rawness of the Raptor R. The visceral feeling of amazement when you step on the servo-less brakes and realise for the first time just how communicative and powerful a brake pedal can really be. And the visceral feeling of sheer joy when you throw the car into a corner and actually believe for a split second that, with the pushrod suspension ahead and the screaming exhaust by your ear and the cabin encased around yourself, that you could just be a racing driver. Driving the Raptor RR will leave you with aching legs from the unboosted brakes, tired arms from the unassisted steering, a stinging face from the constant barrage of flies and debris passing through the windscreen at 60 miles per hour. Your ears will be ringing, your eyes will be watering, and if it were down to just intellect, you'd park up the car, walk away, and drive something with a boot and a windscreen. But instead, the only thoughts filling your mind is the visceral feeling that you need to drive the car just one more mile. We came to Raptor looking for cars, but when there, we found hope. The hope that, with people such as Andy and Kirsten risking it all and working so hard to produce such wonderful machines, Scotland could not only be writing itself a new chapter of automotive history, but also setting up a future that the world will have no choice but to pay attention to. As we climbed back into our VX220 for the last time and left Raptor, the clouds burst and rain lashed our windscreen. It was the first time it had done so the entire trip, and we realised how lucky we had been. Not because of the weather, but because we just spent six days driving 1800 miles and not once thought, Scotland isn't the perfect place to be right now. <laughs>